Hello, everyone. Welcome to the colloquium. Thank you for coming. I'm uh, here to introduce Dr. Ariana Soldati, who is an assistant professor at NC State or North Carolina State. And you've been there a couple of years now, right? right. Two years. So it's sort of mid pandemic where she, when she moved. I first met Ariana back, I don't know, it must have been at least 10 years ago, maybe more, when she was a master's student working with professors at the University of Pisa and at the University of Bristol, Kathy Cashman and Mauro Rosi. And back then you were working on bubbles in lavas using experiments and analog materials. That's right. Yeah. And then from there, she moved on to the University of Missouri and worked with Alan Whittington, who is a rheologist. And she started working with real magmas and looking at their viscosity and how their viscosity changes with temperature with then field applications to lava flows and then soon explosive eruptions as yes. well. And then she spent, how long were you in Munich? Three mm, years. Yeah. Less than two years. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so unfortunately during the pandemic, um, Ariana was in Munich and so she had some of her lab time limited, but she worked on fragmentation and a lot of other rheological instruments in the lab of Don Dingwell at the University of, of Munich. And that's when we really started working together. So, so we uh, I shared some samples. So she started working on the rheology of sunset crater lavas, which is an alkali rich basalt. And that can have some bearing on the rheology. And then she sort of finally kind of successfully made the move to the US during the pandemic and is having a, a, a sort of setting up her own lab and has her own graduate students at NC State. And so I'll sort of leave it at that and please, uh, Ariana has been sort of a, a good mixture of laboratory, uh, analog and real materials, as well as, as a really great field geologist. So ask her lots of questions when you have time. Thank you so much for the introduction. I am really excited to be here. Um, yeah, Amanda and I have known each other for a long time and have uh, tried to work together for a while and finally have a project. And so it's exciting to, to be here, to be able to give this talk, but also to have a uh, further discussion on that and, and see uh, how to interpret this data. So today I am going to tell you a little bit more about my newest research direction, which is rheological time series. And we're gonna see what that uh, means. So first of all, I'm going to start super, super broad to warm us up. And because I know that there's people from all different disciplines in, in the room, uh, volcanoes. So everybody has this picture in their mind, pretty conical mountain, crater on top. And that's what we think of as a volcano. And that's true, of course. But volcanoes can actually have a variety of morphologies. Uh, they can be fissures like Lucky in Iceland, and they can even have an inverted morphology and, and, be, and their um, crater can be filled by a lake as is the case of uh, Goudetazana in France, which is what this, this picture is, or a crater lake um, in the US. And um, this is because actually the definition of a volcano has nothing to do with their external morphology. A volcano is a, is a system that connects magma from where it forms uh, deep inside the earth and gets it to the surface. It's also worth noting that magma is on Earth, melt plus crystal plus bubbles, which is why it has this very complex rheology because there's this interaction between three different phases. But there is a more generic and actually more um, accurate definition, which talks about magma as whatever substance is present in the interior of a planet and can uh, be melted. So, for example, we have cryovolcanism on icy satellites, and we even have ferrovolcanism potentially on metallic quartz, such as uh, Psyche. Uh, and we have volcanoes not only on Earth, but on other planets as well. And this is uh, a really cool comparison of a lava flow in the uh, Sima volcanic field in California on the left, um, where I have worked for part of my PhD, and a lava flow from uh, Mount Mons on, on Venus. And you can see how strikingly similar the morphology of these two lava flows is. Of course, what is very different here is the scale. And uh, 
uh, how not to mention the hot news uh, about uh, lava flows having been identified on Venus. And I'm just going to spend a second pointing out that this paper was published in science with the um, title Surface Changes Observed on a Venusian Volcano During the Magellan Mission. And to me personally, it really made me think of um, testing talk um, from a friend and colleague, Janine Krippner, at IAFSE Big Volcanology Conference that just happened a couple of months ago in New Zealand. And she's working on Mount Narahoi, which most of you will know as Mount Doom, or the stand-in for Mount Doom in, in Lord of the Rings. And she's been doing some um, historical research on um, how those eruptions have changed the morphology of the cone and how those have been covered. Um, in the media and and this is you know my favorite clip from that is uh scientists not excited this was two days before like the biggest paroxysm that the volcano has had so i certainly appreciate being um cautious in sharing results but i am also going active volcanoes on venus they're erupting they could be erupting right now this happened in our lifetime um so maybe a little bit more genuine excitement. So back to Earth, why do we care so much about volcanoes? What sort of role do they play? Well, we have over 1 billion people, which works out to over 14% of what the world population was in 2015, living nearby active volcanoes. So potentially being exposed to volcanic risk. This is a really cool map. It is not the easiest to kind of take in in one look, but what it shows is our world, but the size of um, countries is a scale is inflated um, where there is a high concentration of population and nearby active volcanoes. So you can see uh, areas such as Indonesia and the Western coast of the United States, Latin America and South America, um, Japan, so you see these this, this areas in, inflated. And um, the population nearby active volcano is growing at a rate that is um, faster than the growth rate of just population in other non-volcanic areas uh, in the world. And this is true almost uh, everywhere in the world. So uh, the lens through which I uh, study volcanoes is viscosity. viscosity is an incredible material property. We are all familiar with it in one way or the other. It is, um, you know, what gives many of the foods we love a pleasant texture. It is what allows blood to flow through the smallest vessels um, in our body to, to reach each and every one of our cells. In volcanology, it is what determines flow or blow, basically, what type of eruption are we going to have? Is it going to be effusive or is it going to be um, explosive? And it's also worth noting that this property spends many, many, many orders of magnitude. So for example, if we think about basalt, which is the most common type of lava on earth, and it is, for example, overwhelmingly what gets erupted at Kilauea, shown in this picture here um, on the left, we're talking about a viscosity of more or less 10 to the third pascals per second. That's the um, unit that we use to measure viscosity. But more evolved compositions we say, compositions that have a higher content in silica, such as, for example, dacite, which is not even the upper high of the, uh, not even the upper end of the spectrum. Uh, and it's the example of what was erupted by Mount Pinatubo um, in the Philippines in 1991, are over there 10 to the 10 pascal seconds. So, so seven orders of magnitude. And, and that's a really big uh, change if we think about other properties that we think about in geology, temperature, density, there's nothing that varies on, on this scale. And um, even kind of zooming in more, I specifically focus on the viscosity of effusive um, eruptions of, of lava flows. And in that case, what viscosity tells us is how far is lava going to flow and how fast is it going to get there? So this picture was taken at Leilani Estate, which was one of the developments that was 
uh, partially destroyed during the 2018 eruption of Kilauea. You can see one of the eruptive fissures here and the lava flows, uh, unfortunately menacing and taking down several houses as well as roads and other infrastructure. Uh, now, what do we know and what is left to discover about viscosity? Well, it turns out that we understand the basics pretty well. And there's a couple of things that um, I want to remember throughout this talk. There are two factors that overwhelmingly control viscosity, and they are temperature and composition. So on this diagram here, we see temperature increasing left to right on uh, the x-axis, and um, viscosity is on the y-axis. And then we have different lines, different colors for the different compositions. So Komatiite is a type of lava that no longer gets erupted on Earth. It's a type of ancient lava, very fluid, very high in magnesium. It's one type of composition. Basalt, we've talked about, is the most common um, lava on Earth. And then andesite, dacite, rhyolite. As we go up, the um, content in silica increases. So we go from say maybe 40% um, silica to 70% silica. And you see that um, these compositions can be erupted over a range of compositions. And the hotter they are, the lower the viscosity. And as they cool down, the viscosity increases. And it increases at different rates for the different compositions, but it increases, generally speaking. And we know that this controls the eruptive style that we observe. So for example, low viscosity basaltic eruption could give us lava flows and could give us um, Hawaiian fountains. And then as viscosity increases, we could have lava flows that have a different morphology. You know, they uh, advance more with a bulldozer type motion. They are steeper and taller. Um, and then as we get in the even more evolved compositions, we could have big uh, explosive eruptions. But unfortunately, all of these um, kind of things of viscosity as a property that can be measured and we can obtain one value and that value is representative of the eruption. And this is what has been done so far, okay? Uh, the reality is, however, much more complex than that. Here I'm showing you results from uh, a paper by James Farrell, who was a PhD student um, at the Syracuse Lava Project. So the Syracuse Lava Project, for those of you who don't know it, is this kind of incredible joint venture between a geologist and um, an artist. And it is an outdoor furnace that holds 500 kilograms of lava at a time. And then you can pour it out and you can make lava flows that are comparable in scale to what the lobe of a real lava flow would be like, so a couple of meters. Um, and what James has done with his work is he has created a viscosity map of this lava flow uh, through time, okay? And you see the spatial distribution, so you see that there's a higher viscosity on the sides, and also you see that the viscosity increases as time goes on. Viscosity increases as time goes on because the lava cools down and we've seen that the lower temperature corresponds to a higher viscosity. And of course, this cooling doesn't happen um, exactly at the same rate everywhere in the lava flow. It starts from the margins and it moves inward. And so this is a really great figure that shows us that viscosity is a property that changes in space and time. And with my research, I'm trying to focus on how does viscosity change in time, okay? And in order to do that, I'm going to share uh, results from four different case studies today. And um, they're kind of presented in chronological order of how I've been working on them. And what you see is also that the temporal resolution has been, uh, increasing. So we're going to start with the 2018 eruption of Kilauea, which is kind of been the inspiration for uh, getting into this type of studies where we had access to eight samples over 124 days. And this may not seem like a lot, but going from maybe one viscosity measurement per eruption to having eight for a single eruption was a pretty big deal. And then um, 
Gelding Adalir and Meradalir are the two Iceland eruptions from the, the, the past couple of years. And there we've you know, stepped it up to um, basically, here's the same, like a, a sample every two weeks, but the eruption's been going for much longer. So significantly more um, experiments to, to obtain that time resolution. And then we stepped it up to a sample every three days for a relatively short-lived one. And finally, I'm going to talk about the Cumbre Vieja, the La Palma eruption from 2021, where we basically achieved a sample per day throughout the entire eruption. So really a big step up in um, time resolution of samples that we've been able to analyze. So step one is collecting the samples. And uh, um, this is, I think, what everybody pictures in their mind where you think about, okay, volcanologist goes out to the field and collects samples. And yes, sometimes it happens. That is me at Meridalia in, in August, wearing full gear and going in to, to get a sample of that uh, lava flow breakout. Uh, it's quite impractical to wear all of that, uh, especially if you have to hike out to an eruption site. So sometimes instead, um, just wear a big glove and kind of protect your face and do it really quickly from the side. And sometimes um, your or send you the samples and uh, well, they arrive to you in the lab pre-bagged and you have missed all of the exciting work. And it's okay, sometimes it happens. Um, the next step is preparing the samples. And for me, what that means is taking the rock and heating it up to turn it back into lava by melting it again. So I do this um, in a furnace. Here you see it as it has just been refurbished, all nice and clean and turned off. Um, has some heating elements, some refractory material. And you put your little pieces of lava in the crucible. It goes inside the furnace. When it comes out, there's no more crystals. The bubbles are coming out. You do this multiple times until you're sure that you have obtained a homogeneous uh, glass. And when you're satisfied with it, you can pour the contents into another crucible, which is what you're going to put inside your instrument and use for the viscosity um, measurement. So the experimental apparatus that I use is called a concentric cylinder viscometer. Um, I've named the one in my lab, Phoenix. And um, it's pretty simple. There is a big furnace, which takes up the majority of the, of the instrument. Um, and then the crucible is held on an alumina rod. So it just sits on top of it and gets locked in place and then goes inside the furnace. And at the top, there is a spindle that comes inside the furnace and the crucible. And then you can program the head, um, which contains a motor. So you can decide how far you want to steer uh, the lava with the spindle rotation. So basically, you impose a strain rate, a deformation rate, and you measure the stress that the lava exerts on um, the motor. And that way, you can calculate the uh, viscosity. And I'm going to quickly take you through what the experimental protocol looks like. So you're starting with uh, a rock that has a natural texture. In yellow here, I'm representing the glass. In red, different types of crystals. And in blue, different bubbles. And then you heat it up to super liquidous conditions, 1,500 degrees Celsius, and you let it equilibrate. So after a certain amount of time, you no longer have any bubbles. You no longer have any crystals or crystal seeds, and you only have a homogeneous uh, silicate mass. And then at that point, you can start doing a stepwise cooling protocol. We usually uh, lower the temperature by 25 or 50 degrees at a time. We let it sit so that it equilibrates, and then we measure a different rotation point. The important thing is that we remain above the liquidus in this case, so no crystallization occurs. There are other types of experiments that I do whereby I um, have crystallization at different rates, uh, but we're not going to be talking about that uh, work today. Okay, so we are going to jump into our first um, case study, which is the 2018 eruption of Kilauea. 
So just a, a kind of brief overview of what that eruption looked like. So phase one, we had some rapid strombolian um, eruptions. So these are fissures that started opening up literally in people's backyard um, with pretty explosive uh, activity. Then um, phase two, pretty similar activity. Fissure 17 off to the side. I'm not going to go too much into it, but it's sort of kind of what I'm working on right now. Really weird um, magma, andesitic, so more evolved composition with a strange enclave and an incredible variety of um, types of activity over 200 meters, basically. Um, then we had phase three um, Hawaiian activity and steady, so really pulsating. And finally, phase three, which is what emplaced the majority of the flow field. And again, uh, steady and unsteady Hawaiian fountaining, really super close to each other. So, why this diversity of activity in a really geographically um, constrained space? Uh, it's also worth mentioning that this eruption had enormous impact over the community. We had over 3,000 people evacuated, hundreds of buildings destroyed, and um, a, a lot of damage to infrastructure. A couple of major highways were cut off, and you can see, you know, a few pictures of houses on fire and what roads still look like today, a few years after the eruption. And here you see map of um, lava hazard zone one and outside of these lines is lava hazard zone two and here you can see in red uh, all of the houses that were destroyed by the eruption the outline of the flow is in white and you can see the roads of the subdivision leyline estate which was the one that that was most affected and I'll just spend one more minute telling you about what the situation is right now because it's a, it's a really interesting story. Um, this has been the co costliest volcanic disaster um, in US history since the eruption of Mount St. Helens, over a billion dollars of recovery costs. And that doesn't even take into account the lost revenue from uh, tourism, which is one of the main um, economic drivers of the island. Um, and what happened? Why are, why are there so many people living there? Well, it turns out that starting in the 50s, developers were allowed to build in Lava Zone Hazard 1. They created uh, thousands of individual parcels that they built on and then sold at a generous profit. And as a result, we have a lot more people living there than in uh, other parts of the island. There's also a factor of 10 lower prices on, on median houses. So this eruption, like many eruptions, disproportionately affected uh, a more economically vulnerable part of the population. Uh, and the government came up with this federal voluntary housing buyout program which is voluntary in the sense that nobody is um, forcing residents to take up the government on their offer to buy their land for a um, certain um, amount of money, which is what the um, property was basically valued at on average in 2017 before the eruption. Um, but if you decide not to take the deal, you're off the grid forever. You're not gonna get sewer, water, electricity, ever again on that property. It might be interesting to notice that some people are all about that. So doing field work there, pretty interesting. Residents all, you know, trespassing. It's like that in the entire subdivision. It's really hard to get access to some of these areas because there are certainly some tensions um, the government right now. Okay, back to um, viscosity. So what you see here is a diagram that shows temperature and viscosity. Okay, the different colors are the different phases of the eruptions. The dots are the measurements and the lines are the inter and extrapolations that I have made. And as a 
first kind of big umbrella um, uh, taken point that we can have, certainly viscosity and eruptive style are correlated. So lower viscosity is over here, less explosive activity, higher viscosity, more explosive activity within the same eruptive event. And we can tie that to temperature and composition, which are the two main factors that we said control viscosity. Um, but how much can be ascribed to temperature and how much to composition? So what you see here, the different lines represent the composition, right? Because it's samples from each one of those phases, each one with its own composition remelted. Uh, and then where to position these black dots depend on geothermometry results that we have used to determine at what temperatures were those lava in phase. And so from early phase one to late phase one, to phase two, to phase three, we can see the distance between the uh, colored lines is the effect of um, composition and then um, the jump in between is temperature. And for the um, for Fisher 17, we don't have, uh, unfortunately, such precise uh, observations because of where the Fisher eruption was happening and kind of what was, um, what field data was possible to collect at the time, but we have an idea of what the ranges were. Something else that uh, we have been able to use this data for is actually try and connect seismic uh, data with viscosity and thus with activity. So um, this is a little bit complex, but um, stay with me. We, in this paper, uh, together with Diana Roman, we have been looking um, at FP, uh, fault plane solutions, okay? So what do these tell us? Basically, where is the main stress inside a volcano. When we have a dike, so um, when we have magma rising in a fissure and breaking through the surface, this magma has a viscosity and it exerts a stress on the volcano on the rocks and it can change the stress field of the volcano. And we can measure that. We seismometry is um, quite uh, available on, on many volcanoes. So we can collect this data and we can determine what the stress field was before and as the dike started intruding. Now, sometimes the intrusion completely uh, rotates by 90 degree, the, the prevalent stress field on the volcano. And we see that this doesn't happen always. It only happens, for example, at Kilauea, with the emission of the most discus magmas, which are the ones that came out right at the beginning, early and late phase one, and Fisher 17. But not during phase two and phase three, which were the ones that had more fluid magma. So what's interesting here is that um, these earthquakes are detected before the dike makes it to the surface, so before the eruption starts and they can tell us something about what viscosity can we expect and thus what type of eruptive style we can expect and um, there are a few case studies at other volcanoes yet but we're currently working on a proposal um, to solidify this and try to identify exactly where we should be um, facing the crash. Okay. Um, the next two case studies we're going to look at uh, in conjunction, and they are the two Icelandic eruptions. So there's been great excitement in the community for this. And the first point that I want to make is that this is the capital city of um, Iceland, Reykjavik, and we're less than an hour away to where the eruption site is. So incredibly um, accessible site. Here you can see a map in um, orange. You have the 2022 uh, Geldinga Dalir eruption, and then you read the Meradalir eruption uh, from 2022. And here, in terms of impact, we don't have a negative impact on residents. There is nobody living in that area 
and no roads were destroyed during either of, um, of these eruptions. Instead, what we have is tourism, a lot of volcano tourism. So during the 2021 eruptions, we had thousands of people uh, visiting the site. You can see the pictures here, they're in the snow kind of staying a few steps away from the flow. So very different approach in Iceland versus the US, by the way, in how volcano tourism is managed, right? Like here, think about what happened uh, in Hawaii in 2018, everything got completely shut down. You couldn't get anywhere near. Um, in Iceland, sure, go over there. We'll try to make it easy for you. Uh, we trust that when it gets too hot, they're gonna take a step back. Uh, and I have to say that um, mostly people do. Lava, lava is, is hot at some point, preservation instinct um, kicks in. Now, I did not get to go to that eruption, unfortunately, um, because I had just moved to the States and because of, we'll say the pandemic, I was on a single entry visa, so I could leave, but they weren't going to let me back in. So that's a case where I got my samples in the back from my collaborators, but I did get to go to the 2022 one together um, with my PhD student, Vendela, and um, I want to point out that this was the first day we arrived at this point the eruption had started like three days before and uh this is the the line solid line of cars to get close to the eruption site and fortunately we had a permit and we could um, drive off road because we would have been there all day and then there's a bit of a hike and the crews were out there working hard to complete that trail. So uh, this is amazing. Actually, um, a couple of days after the eruption was over, they completed the trail because it turns out that people were getting uh, injured mainly on the walk over, you know, just like ankle um, issues because it was you know, pretty rough of volcanic terrains. So um, they just started working to make it better, and, and they did. And basically half of the population of Iceland engaged with the eruption in some way, whether it was driving by to see the glow at night or going and making the hike, which, you know, was a two hours hike. So, you know, medium, let's say, uh, level of, uh, of intensity. So this is really cool to, to see how many people kind of participate in this and have those conversations with folks at the flow. We're like, yeah, we're, we're from Iceland. It's, it's our volcano, it's erupting. We're, we're coming to, to see it and, and celebrate it. Uh, and this was the view. So we're gonna take a few minutes to uh, look at some volcano pictures because that seems like a good thing to do halfway through the top end because it was amazing. So this is, um, oh, actually, day eight of the eruption. Yes, took us a while to get over there. So basically, we left Raleigh uh, in the evening, landed in Reykjavik super early in the morning, rented a car, went over there, uh, and were in the field all day. And this was the view. It was pretty amazing. It's pretty zoomed in, but we weren't really like that far from the eruption. So you can see a primary crater pretty tall Hawaiian fountaining, 70 meters. And you can see that the eruption, the fountaining is happening through a lava pond. And I've highlighted the levees here. It's kind of like pretty hard to see, uh, but we can see that the level of the pond was really correlated with the height of the fountain. So if the pond had drained, the fountain was higher. And if the, the, the pond level was higher, then the, the fountain was lower because it's having a harder time uh, traversing all of that lava. And then we had a, a under it. So, and um, the lava is all back there in the pond. So how do we sample it? We have to wait for a breach in the levee that's containing the pond so that lava can come to us because this you do not want to walk on. That, you know, looks fine, but it's lava that has been in place the day before. You don't want to walk on it. Uh, so you have to wait for these breakouts, which happen um, in a very, say, random and sudden way uh, and you get out here where the lava gets to the terrain and you can 
get a sample. And you can see how many people are hanging out around here, some people maybe there with their bikes. Um, and for me, this was kind of a, an ha ah moment of, Oh yeah, sometimes you want a sample, but you can't get it because you just can't get to where the lava is. So not all lava flows, you know, advance in a, in a steady channel and you can approach from the side and get a sample whenever you please. Sometimes it's in the distance. Um, so this is what the this is our lava um, that made it onto the, uh, terrain and started expanding the boundaries of the flow field. And then this is the second day of field work. And we're taking a closer look inside the primary crater and we start seeing barriers forming with better accreting uh, within the crater so that we isolated three uh, separate vents. We see that the cone level is lower. We have the lava bird, this island of uh, more solidified lava that is not moving anywhere. Uh, and here is another one of these breakouts. And what I want to point out is the time scale. So there's timestamps on, on, on there. And you can see that it advances pretty fast. And if you're on top of the hill and you are uh, looking, you basically just have the time to grab your equipment and go rushing down to, to meet the lava to get a sample. And I also want to point out that, you know, an hour later, it's as if this never happened. So how many of you have been to a lava flow field and thought, oh, this was in place at once? Are you sure? Because it's really hard for me to tell, you know, after it was all said and done, how many days, how many single flows made up all of this, right? It's completely impossible to tell. This is just 30 minutes later, let alone if you're working on lava flows that are years or hundreds of years or, or thousands of, of years old. So um, pretty interesting. Uh, here we did see a different type of uh, lava flow front. This is what we call toy poi oi, oi uh, much nicer to sample. And then uh, day three of field work, we start seeing that uh, lava is forming two different flows out of the main crater and into the pond. And the levee of the pond is building up, okay? So it's lavas are, lava flows are kind of the opposite of, of rivers instead of carving their own bed, they, they, uh, they raise their sides. Um, and then, um, this day we weren't so lucky. We just had a lot of tiny little toy breakouts. No lava made it to where we could sample. Um, the activity was clearly diminishing. The cone was building up. The vents were becoming isolated from each other. Um, and then the lava flow started sort of rotating and going into a different direction. So we finally decided to go to the other side, which was kind of a little bit complicated because we had to go through where all of the, the gases uh, and the ash were blowing. And we started following uh, the lava flow. This is not something you can sample. Those levees are not stable. You don't want to get close. Um, but we kept going until we reached the, the lava flow front. And so this, um, this was an area where um, we could get a sample. And this was our last day. Um, in the field, the activity was greatly diminished. We could tell that the eruption was almost over. Uh, and in fact, a couple of days later, it stopped completely. So what about the viscosity? So this has been a lot of experiments and we are going to be looking at the 2021 and 2022 together because to me, what's the most interesting here is the opportunity to look at these eruptions, it's different events coming from the same system and try to use viscosity to tell us something about what's been going on underneath the surface, right? So we see these viscosity variations. There's definitely a pattern here, but I'm not gonna to talk too much about it today. But then we have a long eruptive pause, almost a year. 
And then this is a very short-lived eruption, so you don't really see a pattern. All of the um, data are clustered together. Remember, this eruption went for only two weeks. Um, but all of these viscosities of the 2022 eruption are lower than the 2021 eruption. So to me, what this tells me is that this is new magma that was coming up from depth. It is not magma that remained stuck for a year at the subsurface. It is not the leftovers from the previous eruptions. They kept cooling, crystallizing, differentiating, and then were pushed out because if that had been the case, the viscosity would have been higher, right? So we, we have a timestamp of how long it was between the end of the previous eruptions and the start of this one. And it's because it should have gone up, but it didn't. So this is a new input of magma that we are seeing. Okay, and for our last um, case study, we are going to talk about the Cumbre Vieja eruption of um, La Palma in 2021. This is the highest viscosity monitoring resolution that has ever uh, been achieved. We have three stages basically in this eruption as defined by metrology. We're just gonna, you know, like one to A to B and three and not worry too much about uh, the details of what that means. Here you can see a map of um, the, the sampling as the one from the beginning of the eruption to um, later on. And again, a moment on the, on the impacts, huge um, effect on the population. 9% of the population of the island was uh, displaced. Uh, no deaths, once again, fortunately, but a lot of people displaced and a lot of buildings burned by lava. And I'm going to be there um, later this summer to do some damage assessment the building trend related to morphology of lava flow on a um, National Geographic grant. So uh, viscosity data, uh, I am going to just show you the curves, but there are real data points behind us, okay? So stage one, stage 2A, stage 2B, and stage three. So what are we seeing here? Each line is a different sample. We are seeing the viscosity go down and then come back up some, right? So the way we look at this, we can take slices at different temperatures and um, that we kind of exclude that, we don't consider it. So for example, we can take 1250 degrees Celsius, pretty close to one magnetic temperature, and we can look at how viscosity has been evolving through time. And this is what we see. We see an initial, stage of the eruption, we see viscosity going down. It remains stable for a pretty long time. And then just before the end, it goes up again. Now, I want to draw your attention to the fact that these are very small variations, OK? And I'm aware that the numbers on the y-axis are very small. But the instrument is very precise. The experiments are not done in a series. They're done completely and randomly. Get up you know, in the morning, pick up one bag from the pile, do the experiment so that there's no sort of instrument drift or anything like it that can, um, that can factor in. Um, and so I, I really have a lot of trust in these measurements as relative uh, values. And it's, you know, we could, be modeling something like that. We, we have um, the compositional data, of course, but I really like what uh, my colleague Matt Kankers, who's a scholar on this, on this work said, which is that uh, nature can hide uh, in the resolution of the model. Yes, we could model all of this, but I wouldn't uh, trust the model with its error bars to, to be able to identify a trend. This, this I really trust. So the, the trend is, is real here. Um, so the, this can help us answer the question of where are we, when are we at in an eruption, which is very interesting because we can tell when we think that an eruption is about to start. We have some precursory signs. But once an eruption has started, we can really answer the question, how long is this gonna go for? And with this work for the first time, you know, 
so long as viscosity is going down, we're in initial phase. Stays pretty much stable, it's the middle phase. And then, and you know, we've seen this in, in other eruptions as well, about a week to 10 days before the end, it starts going up again. Now, I perfectly understand that the samples need to be collected, shipped to one of four labs in the world that do this kind of measurements. Measurements take time. And so maybe right now it is not a realistic uh, scene eruption monitoring tool yet, but it's the best we've got. And we're eventually going to get there with the techniques. I um, the other thing that this can help us answer perhaps is where are we at at the subsurface? Where are we at inside the magma chamber? Because why would we observe this, this pattern in viscosity? Like what's the reason? And so um, what we can hypothesize is that we start tapping the magma chamber from the top where we basically have a, a crystal mush. And then we get to the central part of the chamber where we have a lens of homogeneous magma that's perhaps convecting. And then towards the end, we're at the bottom of the magma chamber where once again, viscosity goes up again. Now, it goes up, but it does not reach back up to where it was at the beginning, why not? Because viscosity is very important, but it is not the only thing that matters. It is not the only property that drives an eruption, of course. So stability of a magma is not a function of viscosity alone. Other things matter. For example, overpressure that may have been greatly diminished or exhausted by uh, the end of an eruption. So in conclusion, um, I hope I've shown that uh, with these case studies that viscosity is not just one number per eruption. It is really a parameter to be considered in its complexity and as it evolves through time. And it can be used um, as a tool to forecast eruptive style and to detect what type of magma chamber processes are happening at the sub surface, as well as help us understand where are we at in the progress of the eruption. Um, with this, I want to thank you. I am happy to take any questions in person or later on via email, but I will also um, shamelessly put in a quick plug for a side project that I am doing. Uh, since we talked about the Cumbria eruption, um, you know, that eruption has been one of the first ones in which there's been um, a synergistic work together with media organizations to obtain footage uh, from drones of the eruption, for example. And then scientists have been able to use that footage to figure out where to focus their um, sampling efforts. So really, there's this idea that using footage that is uh, crowdsourced can help us uh, incredibly increase the the time resolution of our observation at volcanic eruptions as well as get views from multiple angles. And this can be really, really important for volcanology, which is still largely um, as a large component of being an observational science. So um, what I am working on is developing an app that will allow us to collect those observations in real time from citizen scientists. The app is called Did You See It? You can uh, download it. There's the QR code there. It's free, of course. Um, it's been developed by a team of students at the University of um, Colorado. So it is a student project. It is currently undergoing testing. So if you download the app, Please be patient, know that this is work in, in progress, but it has um, come a long way. Help us test it, especially if you go out to the field, take pictures and upload them. Eventually, we hope to use this specifically during um, eruptive activity and to make that data freely available to volcanologists worldwide to reduce um, barriers of access, because we know that going uh, to the field is 
expensive and harder for some of our colleagues, you know, who might have their responsibilities or disabilities or other reasons why they cannot participate uh, in field research. But this is a, a really neat way to collect those data and make them available to the community, as well as engaging people who live nearby active volcanoes and um, increasing their curiosity and hopefully trust in uh, the scientific community, which surely comes um, at handy when uh, there is an eruptive uh, crisis. Did you see it? .org. Please download the app and help us. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll uh, take questions from the room and from online. People will type their questions in a chat and I'll just read them to you, Ariana. But, awesome. uh, and then in the room, if you would raise your hand and have a microphone come to you so we can, so everybody can hear. There you go. Yes. Right back there. Yeah, sorry. Um, thanks for this really cool talk. Um, I have a question about your forecasting work. Yeah. Um, so when we were looking at that plot of days versus viscosity, mm -hmm. I noticed that the like net value of the final is within the range of the um, yeah. like the middle part of the eruption. Absolutely. And you were talking about how like seeing this increase in vis viscosity in the final is like an indicator of the end of the eruption, but there's also that upward trend towards the middle of the middle, right? Yeah. yeah. So I'm wondering like practically like how you foresee like this maybe being an issue of like a false indicator or like how you would develop this technique to actually use it in the future. Yeah, uh, we need more data. So we've seen the same, I haven't shown the, the data in the same fashion, but we've seen the same thing during the Geldingadalir eruption and during the Kilauea eruption where uh, there is this trend. And of course it's easier to interpret a posteriori. So uh, the hope is to generate enough data sets to first of all, be able to tell, is this a pattern? Does this always happen? Or maybe it only happens for fissure eruptions. Maybe it only happens in uh, hotspot settings. I'm, I'm not quite sure. I don't have enough data yet. But then I am hoping to run um, basically all of this through um, some sort of AI model so that I can do pattern detection and, and see what, what, what is the, the, the sort of, of difference that is meaningful. And it might very well be that we end up having, you know, a few false positives in there. But if we think about how forecasting the start of an eruption works right now, we also have to recognize that 50% of unrest prizes ends up in nothing. It's 50% false positives. So, you know, if, we end up having a few in the in the middle of an eruption that open you know the possibility that oh we might be close to the end and that doesn't end up happening that might still be you know the the best that we have so far but I think it would still be a, a step in the right direction but it is a limitation of you know to this being an absolutely reliable tool for the time being for sure. My first question, but I was just wondering, you talked about uh, a type of lava that no longer erupts anymore. You briefly mentioned yeah. it. I forgot what yes. it was called, but on, yeah. why doesn't it erupt and what? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Uh, well, it's going to take Thanks. a while to get back there. Um, so Komatiites, some of you might have seen uh, samples in a museum. If you've seen them, you'll remember them. They are very... There we are. Uh, they're very distinctive. They have these very long crystals of olive in it. It's what we call a spinifex texture, named from the Kamatiite River in South Africa, which is the, the type locality. And they are also found um, in Canada. So they are very rich in magnesium. Um, to obtain a melt that contains this much, this much magnesium, uh, you need to melt the mantle of the earth to a higher degree of melting than you can do right now. Why? Because the mantle has been undergoing secular cooling, which means that it has been cooling very slowly from the formation of the earth. 
through nowadays and it will keep slowly cooling down. So the earth is just no longer hot enough to produce this type of, of melt. Um, we have some relatively young macchiaites on Gorgona Island, um, offshore of Colombia. Um, and I, I'm afraid I don't remember exactly the age, but um, we're, we're done with that type of eruptions, unfortunately. About now, yeah. Hey, so I have a question about um, your sampling. Yeah. And so as the lava is sort of flowing towards you, yeah. um, how much can that change the viscosity and how much does it affect like sampling at the toe of the lava than if you were able to sample like at the vent as it was coming out? It depends on what you are interested in. For the type of experiments that, and, and, and the type of experiments that you do. For, for what I work on where I take it and I remelt it completely so, the only thing I care about is the composition. It doesn't matter because it's, the composition is not going to, to change spatially you know, from the vent to the toe. If instead I was especially interested in uh, the crystallinity, there would be a difference because at the vent there would be less, less crystals and by the time it has reached me, the viscosity has increased because uh, more crystallization has, has happened for sure. So if I want to take my study one step further, and, and do the crystallization experiments and relate those to the lava flow, I would need uh, ideally measurements and, and samples from different distances from, from the band. Oh, I, I have a question. So you mentioned that the lava flow on Venus is quite, quite similar. I'm yes. curious, what about the composition? Is that commodulite or is that of a sort? Ah, very good question. Uh, actually, I have a, a student who's working on the rheology of Venusian lava flows, and it turns out that the data we have are not so good and have really big error bars. So we're thinking we're more or less in the basaltic space, uh, but unfortunately, there is still a lot of uncertainty. So certainly looking forward to data from uh, the next mission and, and being able to have a more precise answer to that. Thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm very curious, like, if you can measure the, the distance the lava flows goes, maybe you can estimate the viscosity, and then from your figure, you may say it's more like real ride or commercial ride based on the viscosity. Is that possible? Yeah, absolutely. We can, and we do in many cases here on, on Earth, to use other parameters such as, as length of flow and, and thickness of the flow to reconstruct the viscosity. Now on Venus, there is an additional challenge, which is that the temperature, the surface temperature is very different. So the cooling rate of the flow is very different, um, which on one end means that the lava flow cools down slower. So it remains hot for longer and should flow longer. But on the other side, on the other end, it means that uh, it's less able to form a crust and go into a tube, which is a way in which terrestrial lava flows preserve their, their heat for many, many kilometers. Uh, and then there is pressure. There is a high surface pressure uh, on Venus. And so um, we have an idea of how these factors would affect their viscosity, but we don't have the experimental data yet. So what you're suggesting can be done, but there's some uncertainty that comes. Thank today. you. Right. Yeah, thanks. Uh, great talk. Yeah. I have well, many questions, but I have yeah. two that I want to answer. One to follow up on what Ming Ming was just asking. Are there any people trying to develop <clears throat> observations of the flow field during the emplacement <clears throat> from a UAV or something where yes. you can track and have data on the depth? and measure the velocity field and directly get the viscosity. Yes, absolutely. So we have drawn data for Merodalir. Um, some are stationary, uh, which is kind of like what you need to do the, the velocity analysis. But most of our data are actually just aerial coverage of the field because we're interested in also working on the, on the margins. We have a, a, a project on 
uh, fractal dimensions of uh, lava flows as they get in place and depending on morphology. So we're trying to get a lot of aerial coverage. Um, there were also some challenges related specifically to collecting drone footage at the eruption because there were a lot of tourist helicopters and civil protection helicopters and um, things got very tense with the government at some point, kind of threatening to shut everything down. We could only fly our drones when the helicopters were not flying, of course, so it was tense. But uh, it has been done in other places. Uh, Anat Lev at uh, Aldeo has um, been doing a lot of um, work, I think. She's done Kilauea almost for sure, and possibly some other uh, places with, with um, stationary drone footage uh, using the velocity and then trying to get back to the velocity. Second one, All right? So, second one is uh, um, so I'm interested in the, the role of the volatiles, which you didn't talk about. Yeah. And does the quantity, the amount of volatiles, affect the viscosity? and how it plays a role in the eruption style? Both interesting yeah, questions. absolutely. So uh, volatiles are very important. I cannot do anything with volatiles with my apparatus because it is uh, ambient pressure. So everything gets out of them. So uh, all of this data, you know, the important point is, is, is not, like I'm not trying to say the viscosity of lava is this absolute value that you see. I am using the, the, the relative values to, to try and establish a trend, but you know, volatiles, for example, you know, water will have a significant effect on viscosity. Fortunately, we have quite good models that allow us, you know, to start from a kind of real dry measured value and, and say, okay, if we had 0.5% water, if we had 2% of water, this is how the viscosity would change. Also, volatiles, as you um, correctly said, play a role in the um, eruption style. But there, the beauty is that it is really an interaction with viscosity because the same amount of volatiles going through a fairly fluid magma can generate a Hawaiian tontaning versus through more viscous magma can create an ex more explosive eruption. Oh. Um, you mentioned that uh, there are two reasons for the viscosity, change in viscosity, one's the temperature and the other is the composition. Yes. And um, I've just understood, uh, curious if it's understood in terms of the chemistry, what causes the different, what is the composition that causes the change? Yeah. You know, chemically, one makes, becomes more viscous than the other. And also, um, why is it that different areas of the earth are you know have these different compositions it's just that the earth's surface is not yet thoroughly mixed uh, right so, so that... I'm, I'm gonna start with your second question yes the composition of the mantle is not perfectly homogeneous and depending on tectonic settings there are uh, different parts of the mantle and potentially the the crust that melts to generate uh, a magma, and then the magma can undergo many, many processes in the magma chamber. It can cool down, it can crystallize, it can um, get mixed with uh, the, the host rock. So all sort of things can happen to change its composition from when it forms to when uh, it erupts. And we can really use all of this to at times learn about the mantle, at times learn about the crust. So if we know in the tectonic setting, this can, can, can really allow us to make uh, many observations. Yes, we absolutely know what is it that causes um, the composition to drive viscosity higher or lower. It is a parameter that we call NBO over T, which is basically, you have to think of, of magma as tetrahedra of silicon with or oxygens around it, right? Now, how many of those oxygens tie to the next tetrahedron or to another element and are therefore bridging and how many of them do not? So there are elements that help form these chains, help to polymerize the melt. Um, and that's, for example, the case of silica, which is the most abundant and so sort of takes the, the lion's share of the effect. And then there are elements that have 
the opposite effect, for example, alkali, they depolymerize, the melt, they break those chains, make them shorter. And so this is what um, drives the viscosity uh, lower. One more back there. Well, she's um, uh, where they're getting a microphone back there. There's one comment from the um, from chat, and it's from David Williams. And if anybody wants to see them, there are actually are Kamati uh, samples in his office. And, oh, fantastic! Yes, uh, we no. want to see them. What is he doing tomorrow morning? It, it, oh, so, they, yeah, so I don't know if you heard that, but uh, she's on her way over tomorrow morning. So, and he did his PhD work studying that particular phenomenon. So, fantastic. But, yeah, so I have a bit of a follow up on what Lydia was saying earlier. Um, and this is mostly related to the Kilauea 2018 eruption, since yeah. that's what I know best. Um, so for the early fissure eight stuff, that was erupting fairly crystal rich. Mm -hmm. So I wonder how applicable kind of a bulk melt is to what was actually flowing, because it's going to be that interstitial melt viscosity that is actually controlling the flow. So I don't know if there's like a way that you could design the experiments to like somehow get out just that interstitial glass. So then you're actually measuring what is flowing versus what is the bulk, which may be quite different. Right, so I cannot physically isolate that. So what I typically do is I take the samples to the probe, I measure the composition of the interstitial glass, and then I synthesize that from oxide and carbonate powders. And then I measure that as a liquid. And I have done that for Kilauea for Fisher 8 specifically in a different work. And I've also done crystallization experiments to, to match nature. And of course, we get viscosities that are many orders of magnitude higher than the, just the, the bulk remelt, which is uh, what I've shown today. So yes, absolutely, that's an important point. And that's something that sometimes, unfortunately, gets overlooked in viscosity studies. OK, what is the, the residual melt composition? But you're absolutely right. It is fundamental because that that residual melt in between the crystals and the bubbles is what's flowing. Uh, so it's really important to measure that. Great, thanks. Questions? Anyone? OK, if you're signed up for dinner, stay after. And if anyone has any other more lengthy or detailed questions they want to ask Ariana, you can come up to the front. Thanks, everyone, for coming. And let's thank her again. Thank you. Hey, Hi. thank you so much. Yeah, appreciate it. Yes. Yeah. Ah, to me. Yes. Sorry. Um, yeah. This is mini Wagwa, our director. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>